field that is being used as a replacement for animal therapy in nursing homes, which is really kind of awesome. So she builds planets on Earth, you guys. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our very special event, Not Necessarily Rocket Science. I'm James Monroe. I'm the producer of adult programs at the Museum of Science Boston, and I'm really thrilled to be here tonight celebrating the release of this fantastic new book, Not Necessarily Rocket Science. I'm here tonight with its author, uh, Kelly Girardi, who's going to be joining me in conversation. Uh, we're going to dive deep into her career and her experience in uh, the space industry, as well as so much uh, about the book itself and so much more. So we're just really appreciative of Kelly for joining us tonight and to be a part of this release uh, of the book. And tonight is a part of our current virtual winter-spring season of adult programming here at the museum. We are about halfway through our season Lineup. Still a lot of fantastic work to come. Uh, so, I, you know, every week now through the end of May, I will be here with a different free virtual offering. Um, so I encourage you to check out that full lineup and register for your spot for those events by going to our website, uh, mos.org slash adults. Uh, check out what we have coming up and make sure you spend your winter and spring with us. And uh, so after my conversation tonight with Kelly, we're going to have the chance to ask some of your questions. So if you do have a question for Kelly about the book, you can submit those at any time by going to slido.com and entering the code Kelly Girardi, all one word. Once again, that's slido, S-L-I-D-O.com uh, with the code Kelly Girardi, all one word, and Kelly spelled with an I-E. Uh, and we'll try and get through as many of those as we can a little bit later on. I need to thank our friends uh, from Porter Square Books. Uh, through them tonight, you can actually purchase a, a copy, an autographed copy of Not Necessarily Rocket Science. Uh, that link to do so is going to be scrolling on your screen throughout the evening, so you can visit there, uh, pick up your copy. Uh, it's definitely a great read you won't want to miss. I need to thank our friends from the Lowell Institute as well for their continued support of the adult programming. Without them, uh, we would not be here with Kelly tonight. This event would not be happening, and it wouldn't be free for all of you. So please join me in giving a huge virtual round of applause and thanks to the Lowell Institute. And finally, after my conversation tonight, I ask all of you to go to donate dot mos dot org slash mos at home and consider making a gift to allow us to keep bringing free virtual stem programming just like tonight into all of your homes once again that's donate dot mos dot org slash mos at home but now uh, it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome to the stream our guest of honor tonight the author of not necessarily rocket science kelly girardi Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm looking um, forward to it. Yes, we can't wait. Welcome to the live stream, Kelly. Um, it's really wonderful to be here with you tonight. Um, I wish we could be having this conversation in person. Uh, we'll have to save that for the next book, uh, the next book release. But we do appreciate you being here um, with us tonight. I loved the book. Um, and congratulations on its release. We're going to jump into that in a few moments. Um, Thank you. But I want to start tonight, uh, just so we can take advantage of the time we have. Um, I'm sure a lot of our audience out there already follow you on social media and are fans of yours. But just in case there's some new folks out there, um, could you just start by giving us a little bit of an overview of, of your career and the non-traditional path that you took um, to get to where you are in the space industry tonight? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you again for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And like James mentioned, I'm eager to answer any of your questions at the end about the book or about anything in my career. But to sum up my last 10 years in the commercial spaceflight industry really quickly, you know, I've held roles across policy, media, business development, operations. It's been a wild ride. And I'm part of a suborbital research crew as well, where I've had the uh, privilege to test spacesuits and conduct NASA-supported research in microgravity as part of the International Institute of Astronautical Sciences. Uh, I've also had the privilege to build a really large science communication platform along the way. And my memoir, Not Necessarily Rocket Science, A Beginner's Guide to Life in the Space Age, was published a few months ago. It was incredibly exciting for me. And in that book, I really drive home that our next giant leap will require the contributions of artists, engineers, and everyone in between 
And that's really important to me because my deepest, darkest secret is that I have a film degree. <laughs> I entered this industry as a total outsider and I was able to find a way to contribute and to create impact in my own unique way. And it's something that I know that everyone can do as well if they're motivated and interested in being a part of our next giant leap. I love it. And I think really the connective tissue of the book, you know, are your experiences. And so we'll hear a lot about those as we go along tonight. Um, but that's a great place to start. Uh, I want to just, you know, start with the book. As you said, it was released in November, correct? Yes. And it is your first book, your first published book. Uh, so congrats again on that. Um, you know, it had to have been a bright spot in a really dark year to, to have this book come out in the world. So what has it what has it been like releasing a book, especially in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah, it's been fascinating. You know, I, I if you look behind my shoulder, I have this <laughs> army of cardboard cutout Kellys that were the victims of a canceled book tour yeah. <laughs> that would have been in person, but I'm putting them to good use. And so there were some downsides to it. You know, when you imagine your your book release as a first time author, it's filled with all of these visions of like, I would be there with you live, James, for example. But I would say that the positives were the fact that going virtual this year meant I've been able to connect with the most geographically diverse audience ever. I mean, I've spoken to a number of different countries, different school districts, different individuals. It's really been a, a way for me to connect with a lot of people. And I'm so grateful for that opportunity. Yeah, I mean that we agree with that as well. Like the reach that that we're able to have these virtual events is just it's it's blown it. It's not just Boston anymore. It's it's now really globally. So I can I can imagine how exciting that is for someone who is releasing a product um, and, and a great book like this. So what I love about the book, among so many things, so I am an, an admitted space novice. Um, and you have the way that it's written is it's so accessible. These concepts and, and this this discussion around the industry is so accessible. Um, you truly don't need to be a rocket scientist, hence the title, um, to sort of really engage with it. And as I was reading it, I just really felt your personality coming through. And, and I think it's a perfect written representation of of your your social media presence and, and how you sort of present and represent yourself in the public. And so I'm just curious of what the response has been from your followers and from the industry so far. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th my followers and some of their comments before I wrote the book were what really prompted me to write it. I, For the past five or six years, the questions that I get most frequently are, how can I do what you do? How, mm -hmm. how can I be a part of that? And it, they resonate with me so strongly because those were the questions I was asking other people when I decided, hey, this is an industry I'd really love to be a part of. I don't feel like I'm qualified to even step a foot in the door of this industry. Is there a way for me to contribute? And then sort of figuring out how to open that door for myself and, and having wonderful mentors who helped showed me the way and hold open even more doors for me. That's really what I wanted to pay back. And so this book is you know, part memoir, but it's also part handbook on how to yeah. do the exact same thing. And I, I hope that, you know, the advice ends up being really useful to folks. I think the most rewarding reactions already in the past, uh, you know, I've cried reading some of the Amazon reviews <laughs> just that have come in that are so kind, but they're so rewarding to me because people have mentioned that they've gone back to school for a dream degree or they've applied for a dream job that they weren't going to put their name in the hat for, or they've started science communication platforms of their own and they're really just taking their dreams by the harnesses. And, and I love that. And so it's been something really special to see. I love it. And, you know, I want to spend uh, the rest of our time really digging into some of the sections in the chapters that uh, inspired and interested me the most. And it's a great way, I think, to give everyone out there who haven't who hasn't read the book yet, a great sort of sneak peek. Um, you're definitely going to want to pick that up. And on that note, I just want to again reiterate that uh, through our friends at Porter Square Books tonight, um, you can purchase an autographed copy, uh, a signed copy from Kelly, uh, by going to the website uh, that is sc scrolling at the top of your screen uh, after the Slido. So that'll be up there all night. Um, make sure you do that by the end of the evening. Um, so to jump in, I think in the introduction of the book, you deem this, and it's in the title too, as a beginner's guide to life in the space age. And you really set it up from the start that if we involved everyone and every voice that wants to be a part of this, these conversations, um, that the momentum that we can gain to venture off of Earth and sort of establish survival in the cosmos really will be unparalleled historically. So you kind of touched on this before in your other answer, but how can we how can we non-engineers and non-scientists really get started? Um, how can we even begin to be a part of this work? 
Yeah, so first to set the framework, you know, I drew comparisons in the introduction of the book to the Renaissance because art was really one manifestation of a new way of thinking at that time. But cultural innovation was also happening across all of these vastly different disciplines like medicine, technology, politics, philosophy, science, right? And similarly, I believe that engineering innovation represents just one small slice of the space age and that this time that we are all so lucky to be alive in is actually a broader cultural movement and that our next giant leap will require the contributions of artists, engineers, and everyone in between. I really do believe that we're on the cusp of the golden age of space flight. And so I, th I think through that lens, you can start to think about how interdisciplinary space exploration has always been. Right. Of course, we have the brilliant engineering and, and the human ingenuity that makes this possible. But now, more so than ever before, you start to look at all of the other fields that are critically important, whether it's untangling the legal frameworks for mm -hmm. all of the commercial activity that's to come or the financial you know, bookkeeping to make sure that these, you know, flagship programs are going to meet the milestones and be able to deliver on these big promises, the medicine to send people further away from Earth than they've ever been before in increasingly hostile environments. I mean, these are all opportunities for people from different backgrounds, different skill sets to apply that expertise towards this next giant leap. And you're a testament, I mean, to the value and the importance of, of really embracing non-engineer voices um, and from the start of the book, you center a lot of it around the importance of STEAM versus STEM. So can you talk a little bit about the difference in these ways of thinking? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, STEAM places an A, the arts, in STEM. And I think, you know, for me, it's art and science are sort of the yin and yang of all human in innovation. And so when I think about what that means in practice in the space industry, to me, it means you have an architect who will design a space habitat. And then you'll also need a designer who can make a home away from Earth out of that habitat. For every scientist who is you know, creating this next chapter and adventure, we need also journalists who are able to keep above the fold coverage. We need educators who are gonna inspire the next generation to apply themselves. You know, We need this constant um, well of resources and of talents to contribute to this. And I also think there's something really special about science communication. Mm -hmm. And that's been something that's been a really big part of my career. You know, as we've discussed, I'm not an engineer. I like to say I have an engineering mindset, but that's as close as I have to a formal <laughs> degree in it. And so, you know, that can take you only so far. But I think what I've been able to complement that with is a, a talent for communication and something that I studied formally and the ability to really communicate the story of the data because we're a sentimental species. Mm -hmm. And so the book, like I said, it's kind of really connected through your personal stories and experiences and navigating the industry. Um, and so I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about what your experience has been, um, you know, navigating it as a non-engineer. Have you experienced resistance to your participation in these conversations or any hesitation from the industry in embracing that concept of STEAM? A, a little bit. Look, you know, this industry wasn't an obvious fit for me, <laughs> you know, first coming from the arts background. Of course, my path was really non-traditional. And I think sometimes that comes with this feeling of disproportionate pressure that you need to prove yourself or that somehow, you know, if you make a mistake or you mess up, it's not just a reflection on you, but suddenly it's a reflection on all non-engineers in STEM or in aerospace. And so that pressure can feel really outsized. Uh, I would say a lot of that was self-inflicted in the sense that I had a lot of supportive colleagues. And I think the biggest thing was accepting that I was going to mess up. I didn't know everything out of the gate, but what I held on to was a sense of curiosity and also a, a strong worth work ethic and grit that was going to make me chase down the answers and fill my knowledge gaps. And luckily I had a really supportive group of colleagues who were willing to laugh at my mistakes with me. You know, in one time, I think I covered in the book, my first week working at a rocket company at a spaceport, I mistook a post-it note that said locks thinking, wow, it's a little bit entitled. This team wants smoked salmon for, <laughs> for breakfast. It was liquid oxygen, rocket fuel, right? It's, it's like, these are things that they weren't part of my vocabulary in school. And so they were all new to me. And so little hiccups like that, I just really had to get comfortable with. And I think, so those have been the stumbling blocks, but lots of positives on embracing the concept of STEAM too. I, I think my social media 
presence and my ability to build a large science communication platform through social media platforms like TikTok or Instagram, and the ability to take the conversation onto bookshelves has been really rewarding and just sharing that passion with the public. And I want to talk a little bit about about the social media presence. You know, a major theme of the book and a lot of your work is to democratize the, the industry and the space industry. Um, and so you've really used social media as an amazing tool to sort of further this mission and promote science to a broader audience. Can you just talk a little bit about the power of social media in this realm and, and in the work and how you've harnessed that? Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, it's really fascinating to me to think about all of these tools and the organic reach that's that's capable. I think we really are a sentimental species. And, you know, I think in the book, I used examples around the Apollo program, which perhaps we'll talk about later. But in that, you know, it wasn't the specific experiments on the lunar surface that were really gripping the heart of the public and, and you know, spurring those big confetti parades to welcome mm -hmm. the astronauts home, right? Like, they, you know, the average person wasn't going to be able to tell you about the lunar soil experiment and the impact of that and the data collected. What they were going to be able to share with you in that excitement was the way that this engineering genius was looked at through the lens of an artist. It was sounds and sights from another world. It was, you know, amazing footage of historic first steps and words to go alongside them. And so I think really being able to harness that in platforms like Twitter or Instagram or TikTok that are bite sized, that are able to convey multiple layers of emotion and response to engage our audiences in real time is a very special thing. And so, you know, in the book, you you trace the history of of sort of space interest, um, and I really found it fascinating. There's a lot in there that I was not aware of, so I'm hoping that you can do a little bit of that now. I know we could spend the rest of the the hour talking about that, but I'm just curious about like how did ancient cultures record and lay the foundation to our current and modern day space age? Yeah, absolutely, and, and I will try to do it in a nutshell. But <laughs> as you can imagine, it's like early humans feared and worshipped the night sky. And I wrote in my book about how we believed that we were the center of the universe. And so any events that were observed in the sky, you know, early humans thought that was directly related to our performance where we, you know, it was a solar eclipse or a meteor. Did we do something wrong? Are we being punished? Are we being rewarded? Right. And so you can sympathize with with those early assumptions that like the gods themselves must be pulling the strings and using our sky as a canvas. You know, and that led later on to ancient cultures really painstakingly recording celestial phenomenon, creating the first records. And in this way, astronomy became our first and original science. Uh, the Babylonians in particular were, you know, particularly scholarly and took that empirical approach to, to tracking the data. Um, and then it came into the hands of the Greeks. And I think, you know, you go on and on mythology inspired philosophy, philosophers began thinking scientifically, we just have this continual sort of uh, acceleration in our ability to investigate the world around us. But I think what was my biggest takeaway from, you know, that very condensed history is that, you know, we really are a sentimental species to come back to it. And we know now that maybe we're not geographically the center of the universe, right? But I think it always <laughs> comes back to us when we're thinking about the impact of exploration, right? And what captivates us. The big questions are always self-centered. It's where did we come from? Are we alone? What else is out there? Yep. That's really what I think propels us further out in the universe. And so it's something I feel very connected to. I think it's pretty innate in human history to want to seek those answers. And luckily for us, more than ever before, we are closer and closer to being able to at least add more data to get us closer to an answer. For sure. So I wanna jump to um, a really great chapter and you, you, kinda, you already touched base on, on the topic, but um, the history that you trace about the, the Apollo program. Um, you know, for some, just for some of our audience out there that may not be familiar, what were some of the achievements of this program and the different missions and crews that were, were a part of it? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it was a moonshot, both literally and figuratively. And just to put into perspective what an audacious goal this was for America to set, Alan Shepard was America's first astronaut, and he was he completed a suborbital spaceflight aboard Freedom 7 right, in the late 60s, uh, yeah, in 1961, I believe. And 
three weeks after that suborbital spaceflight, mind you, we had not yet sent a person even into orbit, but three weeks later, you know, the president, Kennedy, committed America to landing a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And it was just, you know, the most audacious goal you can imagine. And so I think, you know, he rightfully said that there will be no single space project in this period more impressive to humankind, more important in the long term exploration. Right. And, you know, to America's credit, we did it right. And it was not without a lot of difficulty and without a lot of loss as well. One great tragedy that occurred during this time was the loss of Apollo one. It was a fire that occurred on the capsule pad. Uh, it was a test. And unfortunately, Gus Grissom, Ed White, Roger Chafee, their lives were lost as a result of that tragedy. And that was in 1967. And the two years that followed, though, as America recommitted themselves to achieve this goal, even in light of the tragedy, were turbocharged with progress and some of the most just enormous achievements. I think uh, Apollo 7 completed an 11 day test flight and they earned an Emmy because they were broadcasting from Earth's orbit, which was really cool. And then Apollo 8 became the first humans to enter lunar orbit. And that was on picture, they sent pictures on Christmas Eve of the lunar surface. Apollo 9 practiced rendezvous and docking. It was just all these incremental, amazing achievements that finally led up to the big win, which was landing in 1969 on the lunar surface, taking those first big steps, small steps, in his words, but giant leaps <laughs> for mankind. And were were there any non-engineers involved in, in the program or in any of these these achievements? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, one of the most interesting uh, folks to me was Harrison Schmidt. Um, this was part of the like final Apollo mission, but uh, he was an unlikely crew member and he was the first ever professional scientist to be selected to go to space. He was formally trained as a geologist and NASA selected Schmidt in their first ever class of scientist astronaut candidates. And instead of the usual test pilots, which were previously chosen, and this was you know, the last attempt to uh, reach the lunar surface and investigate it. And so luckily America finally sent a scientist to the moon on that mission. And I think that his selection set a really important precedent for civilians and academics in the astronaut corps going forward. Yeah, it's so funny you mention him. You know, you you talk about so many important figures and people throughout the entire book, and that was one of I have him noted. It was a question I was going to ask you was about his involvement um, because I just I I was so curious about about his story. So thank you for for mentioning him. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how politics has influenced the space industry, but but specifically the Apollo program in both negative and positive ways. And you, you outline that in the book. Can you give us a, a sort of a little bit of insight into how the two were tied? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think the ending of Apollo uh, as a program was a great illustration of how intertwined politics and, and public interest uh, as well are with the space program, especially a government funded space program. And so uh, the program faded in the 1970s and Nixon, President Nixon at that time rejected proposals for sustained human presence on the moon. The Apollo program was cut short and his rationale really foreshadowed the, the limitations of relying solely on government for space exploration. He was you know, letting people know that we have to recognize that there are a lot of critical problems right here on earth that make high priority demands of our resources and our attention right now. And he's not wrong with that, but I think what we've learned from that is that a diversity of approaches is really important. And what we're seeing with the expansion of Earth's economic sphere are other players, other companies who are coming in to help partner with government to be able to create some sustained presence in low Earth orbit. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about that um, in a few minutes. Um, but I do want to touch base because you, you outline and, and pay tribute to two really well-known space tragedies, the Challenger and the Columbia, um, both of which I believe recently had anniversaries, January and February, if I recall your book correctly. Um, how did those impact sort of the interest around space travel, and what did the industry learner take away from, from those? Yeah, there were a lot of lessons learned. These were some of the hardest learned lessons in the space shuttle program. I think really driving home that spaceflight is incredibly hard and incredibly risky. 
you know, after both disasters, the space shuttle program, you know, was suspended, inquiries were made, right, procedures were overhauled, contingency plans were enacted for the future. You know, the reality is that you know, this disaster had happened both times and lives had been lost as a result of it. And so I, I think there was at the time some uncertainty around the future of America's commitment to space exploration when faced with the enormous cost uh, as it relates to human lives. But I think, you know, one of the most poignant takeaways to me was hearing uh, a quote from the husband of fallen astronaut Laurel Clark, and he was at the Columbia Crew Memorial, and he said, America can either be space fearing or space faring, but to continue to move forward, there has to be a national acceptance of risk. And I thought that was just such a wonderful tribute to those who had given their lives for something that they were so passionate about and who were opening the door to the future of space exploration on behalf of an entire species, true pathfinders. And so I think that was something that was really moving. And, you know, at the time after, you know, tragedy, George W. Bush, you know, got on television and he addressed a mourning nation with similar promises of resiliency there and committed that the cause in which they died will continue and our journey in space will go on. And so I want to jump, speaking of going on, um, to the concept of the commercial spaceflight industry. So for people out there who maybe haven't read the book yet, what does that mean? What is the commercial spaceflight industry? Yeah, absolutely. So you can imagine just to set the scene, it's like early 2000s and you are looking at the cradle of Silicon Valley yeah. and here are a bunch of new companies that are emerging to disrupt the old way of doing business. They are looking for increased agility, speed, innovation. They're trying to dramatically lower the cost of reaching space so that more and more people and companies can go. And so I think what had happened before you know, this burst of um, entrepreneurial attention in space was that there was a stagnation. There was a lack of competition in the industry. There were, you know, defense contractors longstanding who had accomplished incredible things in partnership with the U.S. government. But because there wasn't a lot of competition, there was no real business incentive to lower the cost of launch or to risk success with new novel approaches. And so here enters all of this sort of Silicon Valley mindset and entrepreneurs who are thinking there's maybe a better way to do these things. At the time, rockets were not reusable. I, I think many of us today may have heard of SpaceX mm -hmm. by now and, and understand some of the imagery that you know the rocket can come back down and be reused, a booster of a Falcon 9. At the time, prior to that you know, game-changing step of reusability, it was like throwing away an airplane every time you flew across the ocean, just tossing a 747 one-time use. And so you can imagine how game-changing some of these innovations were to reduce the cost of access to space, which was really, really setting the stage for you know the next couple of years that followed. Yeah, game changer. And so um, this work really, from reading the book, really seemed to inspire your career. Um, and you know, how and why was this work so intriguing and inspiring to you as you were graduating and, and the 2000s were coming to an end? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, for me, it was, I grew up with the backdrop of the space shuttle program in my adolescence. And in fact, I could literally see them launch from my bedroom window in South Florida. And so I, it was interesting to me that I had all of the exposure in the world to this industry. And I still didn't connect the dots that that was something I could be a part of. I thought it was just a cool byproduct of being alive in the same window of time as these extraordinary people. It didn't dawn on me that there was an entire ecosystem powering this industry. And so when I graduated from college, it happened to be the same year that the space shuttle program retired. And I remember thinking like, oh, that's a shame. You know, like I, it seemed to me like that we had lost something as a nation, not knowing the full story, which was that this was a planned retirement of the space shuttle program specifically so that we can invest in novel approaches. And it was also the birth of the commercial space flight industry and some of these private companies that were going to be able in the years to come to partner with NASA to restore access to orbit and to help free up NASA resources for long duration space flight achievements and exploration that maybe doesn't have a strong business case like what's at Europa, you know, mm -hmm. what is under, um, you know, some of these interesting surfaces on other celestial bodies. So, you know, I want to jump now to chapter six, 
which uh, is one of the most interesting to me, and I think it, it sort of revolves around one of the most commonly inquired about topics that we really get um, here on our team when we talk about space, and that's Mars and traveling to Mars and the colonization of Mars. Why do you think that there's such a fascination right now with, with you know, creating and establishing life on Mars? And how do you think that this parallels or differs to the 1960s and the fascination with getting to the moon? Yeah, I think it's, you know, there's something of a siren song <laughs> about Mars. You know, it's our planet next door, like a world away from home. It's something that really represents sort of the next big milestone in exploration and in human exploration. And I think it's tantalizingly close to us. We've been able to send rovers as you know precursors to human exploration. We can see it, we can reach it robotically. It's, it's right there, it's calling us. And it's also teasing us with the potential of ancient life, microbial life, right? It can yeah. hold the answers to some of our oldest and most existential questions. So I think there's quite a lot to love about it. And I think right now is a fascinating time because we've seen how capable we are, like the level of human ingenuity to land Perseverance rover with precision on the rim of a crater, carrying a helicopter that will perform the first powered flight on another planet. So imagine Perseverance roving around looking for ancient life, ingenuity, the helicopter flying above, seeking out scientifically interesting locations. It's like, this is a planet entirely inhabited by robots. How cool is that to say? So I, I think there's a lot that draws our inner explorers to these uncharted places. And speaking of explorers, um, before we get to the, the next story, can you just explain quickly what the Explorers Club is and your involvement with that? Yes, very happy to. So the Explorers Club is an international multidisciplinary scientific society, and their members are responsible for a series of famous firsts in exploration. First to the moon, first to the North Pole, South Pole, first to climb Mount Everest, bottom of the ocean, you name it. An Explorers Club flag has, has been there and traveled to these places. And I, you know, also right after college, I was working coat check at the Explorers Club in New York City at their headquarters and really, you know, volunteering my time to check the coats of the people I was most fascinated with in the world. This is also uh, where I met one of my mentors, uh, Richard Garriott, who was a private astronaut who opened my eyes to the fact that civilians could go to space and find another way outside of the NASA route. It blew my mind. He also, and his wife, Leticia, helped introduce me to the commercial spaceflight industry and to the Commercial Spaceflight Federation where, where I first worked. And fast forward a number of years, it was really uh, thrilling and rewarding for me. This past year, I was asked to join the Explorers Club Board of Directors. And so it just came full circle. You can imagine this, you know, post-college student kind of at coat check, just so excited to yeah. be there to being able to be a part of their next chapter uh, in this new way. So it was just really moving. I love that full circle moment. So that's great. Um, thank you for, for talking a little bit about that because there's a great story um, of an interaction that you had with Professor Stephen Hawking at the Explorers Club annual dinner. So I just loved this part of the book. Can you just share with our audience what happened? Yeah, absolutely. So Professor Hawking uh, was kind enough to agree to do a keynote for our Explorers Club annual dinner. And I had the opportunity to, to pose a question to him about his thoughts on space exploration, space settlement, and the urgency of, of those things. And in his commentary, he shared, not to leave planet Earth would be like being castaways on a desert island, not trying to escape. Um, he said that sending humans to other planets will shape the future of the human race in ways we don't yet understand and will determine perhaps if we have any future at all. And because he is also full of humor and mischief, he added, and if there's an asteroid on collision course with Earth, not even Bruce Willis could save us. <laughs> and so it, it was just, you know, he's someone to add one other vignette I would just add about him because he had such an impact on my life and his life had such an impact on the world. It was a joy to know him and witness not only his brilliance, but also his mischief and his sense of humor. Um, and I think one of the just illustrations of that was I was at his 75th birthday party and I remember looking at the diverse group of people in this room here to celebrate his life. And it was some, you know, esteemed academics that you might expect. There were also people from film and television and also everywhere in between. Like you couldn't awesome. believe the diversity of people, of friendships that he had formed. 
And it just made me think like this sums up a life really well lived. And I just think he left his thumbprint on the entire world. For sure. And I love that. So thank you for, for sharing those personal stories. Um, so what are the challenges? Uh, simple question. What are the challenges that we face to surviving on Mars? You detail in the book work that was done by the Mars Society and the Mars Desert Research Station. Can you talk a little bit about those projects and that work and your experience at the research station specifically and what you deem in the book the proof of beer study? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So just, you know, off the top, Mars is an incredibly hostile environment. It is designed to kill you. There is nothing pleasant <laughs> about imagining the early settlers' experience on Mars. Like, you know, I, I, I want to be very clear and upfront that there is nothing like glamorous to, to think of when you think of what they would go through and what they will go through one day. Um, so I did have a tiny taste of the Red Planet. I spent a few weeks in isolation as a crew member at the Mars Desert Research Station, like you mentioned. I was on a crew of seven folks from all over the world different scientists and space agencies. And we were conducting analog Mars research and seeing what it would be like to live on the red planet. And so one of the experiments that got a lot of attention was, um, as you mentioned, this proof of beer study. So growing your own crops is going to be critically important. You know, creating your own food source and water sources on another planet will be really critical to your survival. And so we decided we were going to do a proof of beer study. And so we grew sorghum seeds and hops rhizomes in NASA grade Mars dirt, basically. And we chose the crops for a few academic reasons. The official reason is that sorghum is a really like highly nutritious grain that has low water needs, which is great. Um, and hops can also be used as a medicinal herb, which is awesome. Both are great candidates for Mars. But obviously the real other reason, and the fun one, was that those are two out of the three constituent ingredients in beer, the other one being yeast, which has already been to space. And so we, we were thinking that perhaps that might make Mars a little bit more appealing <laughs> if early explorers knew that they could have a cold beer at the end of the day. And Got a huge reaction. <laughs> yeah. It was really uh, something. Uh, did it work? <laughs> yeah, it, it did. It did. Obviously, you know, the limitation of the study is that we didn't have access to um, real Mars dirt. Yeah. <laughs> and so there are other like chemical properties in For real sure. Mars dirt that need to be studied. But it's always funny. This was in 2014, I think. But it comes back and my name keeps getting associated. And just to share with the audience, it's like, my, I don't drink alcohol, I just choose not to, but I am forever associated as like with beer. And every time something comes up about it, it's like with the Perseverance landing, a, a publication ran an article that said, researchers like Kelly Girardi are really excited about Perseverance Rover because that will unlock the next step in making Mars beer a reality. And it's like, suddenly I'm just summed up as being really obsessed with beer. The Mars beer woman, yeah. Um, but you kind of pointed it out. It, that study received, you know, a pretty great public response, right? Like, what was that like? It was amazing. It, it was great. Like, one one quick funny story from that is I got a call from Playboy. <laughs> and, and when you get the call, you're like, you know, in my mind, at least, I was like, flustered, flattered a little bit, but yeah. also preparing how to like really gently explain that I couldn't take advantage of this particular opportunity. And she very quickly confirmed that this one was really all about the article. <laughs> and uh, that was humbling, <laughs> but it was, um, I think I still hold the record of like the most clothed covered woman ever to be featured by Playboy because <laughs> there was a photo of me that ran in a full spacesuit with a fogged helmet. <laughs> and so I, I sent it to my parents. I was like, are you proud yet? <laughs> it was great. That's amazing. Um, I loved that part in the book as well. Um, so you, in this chapter, talk about another um, sort of relationship in history with another um, program that also gained, I think, some public, um, some public uh, exposure. Um, and that's Mars One. And so we actually did a conversation a few years back here at the museum as a part of this, this series of adult programming that really was exploring this program and highlighting it and it brought in some of the applicants' voices. Um, so it was really interesting for me to read about your firsthand experience. Um, you state that you do have a complicated history with Mars One and I'm just hoping if you'd be willing to share a little bit about, A, for those who don't know what was and is Mars One um, and what was your participation in the program and what was that reception like? 
Totally. So Mars One was this controversial nonprofit company that was proposing to send four humans on a one-way ride to start a settlement on Mars. And I think, you know, in that media frenzy, what was lost a little bit, the nuance was that Mars One was not an aerospace company. They were not proposing that they were going to build any hardware. They were just the supernova of a nonprofit. And they had this single media premise, which was they were going to attempt to close a multi-billion dollar business case through selling broadcast rights. They believed that the global spectacle of sending people to Mars could actually raise enough dollars to pay the engineering teams to make that possible and pay for the hardware that'll get them there in the first place. So that, that last point is what resonated with me when I heard this. My common ground with Mars One was anchored in the shared belief that the biggest barriers to human settlement of Mars are largely economic mm. rather than engineering at mm. this point. And so, you know, their existence as an organization presented a lot of fair critiques about like what is considered feasible, both timeline wise, funding wise, dollar wise, all of these things. But what I was trying to make the point of amidst this, you know, weather storm kind of conversation in the media was there was this broader giggle factor about Mars settlement that I felt was a little bit unwarranted. And so the coverage that I found when I was interviewed about it, it often ignored the actual engineering achievability of sending humans to another planet. And instead it was zeroing in on this perceived insanity of anyone who might be willing to go. And so, you know, while I privately agreed that Mars One had a very unrealistic chance of ever going anywhere, I considered their $40 application fee like a reasonable investment for the opportunity to like have a voice in this conversation and try to redirect it. I found myself down selected like pretty quickly from the hundreds of thousands to the top 100. <laughs> and so that presented that crossroads in, in my career where I found myself listed as like one of these 100 candidates to, you know, go settle Mars. And it put me in a little bit of a precarious position with, you know, the respectable career that I've built, you know, anchored on realistic timelines for spaceflight companies and all of this stuff. And then the growing spectacle in the media uh, of Mars One. And so it was a really interesting thing, but I, I still, you know, I, I did move away from, from the organization, but I, I think there is something there. Exploration needs both patrons and pioneers. And we, this is, look at what's happening now. Look at the Inspiration4 mission coming from SpaceX. Here is a billionaire who is committing the money to take four civilians in a contest mm -hmm. to raise money for St. Jude's to space for the first time. Or the Dear Moon project where a Japanese billionaire is going to uh, take a spacecraft further than you know humans have ever been from Earth around an orbit of the moon, again, with eight artists with him. So there's precedent mm. for these types of fundraising activities that we are seeing now, market data that backs up spaces, something that should be looked at. Yeah, and um, it's just, it was a fascinating sort of concept to me. And so thank you for sharing about that. And you had a very interesting um, experience on The View uh, <laughs> through it. And we'll save that for readers to, to read about when they pick up a copy of the book. But um, I loved that part as well. Um, so I want to move on to sort of the concept and the sort of theme of democratizing space. I love this passage from the book. You said, I'm not sure I can pinpoint a specific moment in which I crossed the threshold from space outsider to space insider. But it was around this time that I finally understood the difference between inclusion and belonging. Um, and I just, I, that resonated with me on so many levels, even outside of the concept of the space industry. And so these notions of diversity, equity, and inclusion come up throughout the book in your own story when you sort of trace the groundbreaking successes of the female human computers, um, you know, the most renowned of whom were black women, uh, the fight to allow women to go to space. So how would you describe the necessity of DE&I within the, the space industry? Yeah, absolutely. I always like to sum it up with the reflection that after my own decade of whiteboards and war rooms, I have learned that the people who design the technology are the ones who hold the power to influence how it's applied. And so that in a high tech, high stakes industry like aerospace, it becomes really important and in everyone's best interest to cultivate the broadest possible set of perspectives and diverse approaches to these complex problems of the future. And I think further to put it in perspective, when we are talking about, you know, the discussions like we've had tonight about space settlement, exploration, you know, what we're really discussing is the future of the entire human species. And so that 
the stakes are just too high for any single demographic to be steering the entirety of Spaceship Earth. You know, I, I think a lot of great strides have been made. Obviously, there's always more work to be done. I think sometimes people confuse lowering barriers with lowering the bar. Those are two completely different things. And our industry, more than anyone else, should understand the nuance there. What we're trying to do explicitly is lower the barriers to space. It's not about lowering the bar. And so I think there's, um, you know, this is a really timely conversation in society in and outside of the aerospace industry. For sure. And there's a great chapter in the book that has you sort of giving your advice and top 10 tips to readers out there who would be interested in, in participating in the space age. Um, and one of the tips that really resonated the most with me when thinking about the concept of outsiders trying to participate in, in the industry, but also just like in something that they feel like they, they aren't gonna be a, accepted to be a part of, um, was the, the tip about repurposing imposter syndrome. So I just love, would you elaborate on this and sort of talk about how you've ingrained that in, in your own journey? Yeah, absolutely. One of the biggest takeaways that blew my mind is that the people I respected most in the world suffered from chronic self-doubt. So that alone was like, okay, wait a minute. It's, it's not just me. Everyone has this. But I learned that there was a big difference between being an imposter and being an outsider. And that was really critical to unpack because to be an imposter would mean that I was forging a career in an industry that I had no right to be in mm -hmm. while being an outsider just meant that I had a lot of work to do to fill in my knowledge gaps and to build credibility in that industry. And so I think it's a really important distinction and framework when you're thinking about your goals. And I, I think women are especially vulnerable to that type of thinking, when, uh, particularly when it comes to applying for jobs. It's like the difference between looking at a bullet list of qualifications for a role and saying like, oh, I've got expertise in everything except that one, I'm not qualified, versus saying like, okay, I've got most of these and I'm confident I can pick up the rest on the job and putting your name in the ring for the opportunity. And so that was something that really unlocked a new sense of confidence in my own capabilities. And so I want to end our formal conversation and then we're going to jump to, to audience questions. So if you have a question, you can still submit that by going to slido.com and entering the code Kelly Girardi, all one word. Um, but I want to end our conversation acknowledging the past year that that our world has gone through and that we as a country have gone through. Um, you know, and it's been a challenging year for space, Spaceship Earth, as you put it. Um, and I'm curious if the pandemic and, and everything that this year has brought has made you think differently about the responsibilities of the space industry. Yeah, 100%. I, I think 2020 has sharpened the lens for a lot of people. One of my biggest takeaways was you know, the reality that the contrast and the emotional dissonance between exhilarating space achievements in the summer of 2020, for example, mm -hmm. you know, the first crude uh, space flight from U.S. soil since the end of the shuttle program happened with a SpaceX sending astronauts from U.S. soil to the space station it was a monumental achievement. But look at the backdrop of that in society. It was against this backdrop of devastating earthly happenings. And so I was reflecting that, you know, that contrast and emotional dissonance is only going to continue as the decade unfolds and as the next decade unfolds. And so I think it's just a great reminder that, you know, the commercial spaceflight industry and certainly the human spaceflight industry can never exist independent of what's happening on Earth to humans. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of work. I think the stakes are, are really high in, in that aspect. And I think that while I believe there is not a mutual exclusivity here to caring about space exploration and caring about Earth, and of course the planet that NASA studies most is Earth. It is our own home environment and this precious planet on which all known life lives. But I do think that you know the space industry uh, is not immune to other societal plagues, you know, like bias, whether it's overt or implicit, and mm -hmm. then actual plagues, <laughs> like <laughs> pandemics and other health threats. And so I, I think it is a, a learning curve for a lot of industries. Thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. It, I literally could go on talking to you all night. I have so many more questions. So um, we'll take those offline um, or save it for the next part two 
uh, when we can have you here. But I do want to make sure the questions are rolling in uh, from the audience. Once again, we can we can still take those. If you have a question, you, you can still submit that. Um, and also just another final plug of you still have time to go uh, to the link uh, that's coming on your screen right now uh, and purchase a, an autographed copy of the book through our friends at Porter Square Books. Um, it's just a fantastic read. Um, so I'm going to just jump right in. Uh, uh, what's it like in microgravity and what sort of research have you done? Totally. So to imagine what it's like to float in microgravity, imagine that you're floating on your back in a swimming pool, arms and legs spread, and then just subtract the sensation of water. And that's kind of what it's like. It's like very serene, you're floating weightless. And the way you achieve that is in an aircraft that does this roller coaster profile they're called parabolas. And so you go up and you get that eyeballs in pressure um, of high G. And then you kind of come over gently over this curve and you enter a free fall. And during those precious seconds, you are experiencing an environment of microgravity or, or an analog of microgravity. And that's when you kind of like do all of your research <laughs> in those precious seconds. And then you do 18 to 20 of those. So some of the coolest research I've done, um, obviously, evaluating commercial spacesuits that's been awesome like this one from final frontier design i think you know the things that i was looking for is comfort you know uh, able to wear inside the vehicle dexterity like wrist movement to manipulate really you know small payload parts is really important the other cool piece of research i did was i swallowed this bluetooth pill for the canadian national research council <laughs> that was designed to uh, track my temp my core body temperature and I was able to pair and unpair my body with this tablet that was tracking my temps and my stats in real time. So that, that was just like one of those welcome to the future moments. That's like a sci-fi film. Um, yeah. In the book, uh, this person saying in the book, you, you talk about how, you know, your success in the industry wasn't just all accomplished by yourself and, and that there were a lot of people that helped you along the way. Can you share a little bit about um, some of the mentors that have impacted your, your journey and your career? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, some of my biggest mentors, uh, you know, I briefly mentioned earlier, but Richard Garriott Takayo and his wife, Leticia, both are, you know, space industry luminaries, brilliant, brilliant people. Richard has um, visited the space station himself as a private civilian. He was formerly a video game entrepreneur, very successful video game entrepreneur. He invented MMORPGs for any gamers out there. So really, really cool background. And his dad was also an astronaut, funny enough, with Skylab, a NASA astronaut. But the two of them really, you know, took my uh, like unbridled curiosity and helped me shape it into really focused drive and, and you know, work ethic in the space industry. They entertained all of my questions. There was no thing, no such thing as something that was like too silly or, uh, you know, a, too elementary, I guess. And they were able to both make connections, which is really important. Like mentorship is part guiding people through their career decisions, but they took the extra step and became sponsors in they, their, my career. They put their names down as collateral for my next steps in the industry. They were vouching for me. And so I have done my best throughout my career to pay it forward to them. Richard was actually my sponsor as a member into the Explorers Club. And because like I mentioned, I love things coming full circle. Just last week, uh, we elected him as the new president of the Explorers Club. Amazing. And so it's just, you know, it's a love fest. It's, it's amazing. I am so lucky to have learned from such incredible people in this industry. And, you know, that continues. And it's something I really try to pay forward. I love that. And you actually led right into the next question. Someone's wondering what the process for gaining membership to the Explorers Club is. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Explorers Club membership is basically evidenced by field exploration, but it's not limited to the traditional sense of field exploration. It could also be space exploration, as we have uh, scientists who have, you know, tracked exoplanets and discovered things uh, digitally um, from Earth who are engaging in exploration, but perhaps not in the traditional sense that you might imagine. And so any sort of, um, you know, background or experience in scientific exploration is really the, the bare um, credentials to apply for membership. And I think another great thing about the club is there are a lot of initiatives that are there to help people 
find opportunities to gain that credibility. So it's not just about, well, how do I get started if I don't have that? It's here are some resources so that you can start to get matched with opportunities where you can join and contribute to scientific research, build up your credibility, and then apply for membership because you've earned it. That's cool. All right, a fun one. Since you work in the space industry and have a film degree background, I have to ask, what is your favorite sci-fi movie and or TV series? Um, yeah, you might think Star Wars because of <laughs> the Hoosier, Imperial yeah. Stormtrooper behind me. And I did have Stormtroopers at my wedding, um, <laughs> which was great. But my favorite movies are probably like more classic sci-fi, space sci-fi thrillers in my mind. I like Gattaca. I like Solaris. I like Sunshine, Moon, you know, movies like that that are a, a little bit uh, gritty <laughs> and maybe a little scary and a little less anchored in reality. Cool. Um, I like this question. On social media, you've shared content um, featuring your superstar daughter and the news that you'll be publishing a kid's book series. As a parent, do you have any advice for cultivating a love of steam with children at home? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I have to give credit to this one, um, to my mentor, Leticia, who did an interview in the last few pages of my book. I spoke to her and a bunch of other people, and I asked her this exact question because her family and her young children were the model for my own when I thought of like, how, how do I you know, help establish this love of space in, in a young child? And her answer was just continuing to nurture that innate sense of curiosity wherever it is applied. You know, if a child is excited by a lizard that they see in the grass, really helping them follow that thread and seek answers to the questions that naturally come to their mind and really helping them follow and connect the dots to, okay, well, well, how would we figure out what the answer to that is? That's a great question. You know, let, let's go find the answer. And I think sort of building that muscle memory in a child can be really powerful. That's great. Great advice for all the parents out there um, watching with us tonight. Um, do you ever feel, do you ever still feel like an outsider in the industry and how do you deal with that? Also, what are some of your favorite books? So a double, a triple parter there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so yes, yes, absolutely. I certainly have moments where my confidence is low. Um, I think though, like the biggest transformation for me in the beginning, there was this you know, fear that if I made a mistake, it was like this disproportionate pressure when I was first starting out. It was like somehow that was going to be if I messed up a reflection on all women in STEM or all non-engineers in the space industry. And so it was that outsized pressure that felt really scary. Uh, I think the other thing when I was first starting out that was a challenge is I, I didn't see a lot of people who looked like me necessarily in the sense that, you know, I love fashion, I, I love makeup, I, you know, I, I have multitudes. And I remember trying to really tone down my appearance because I wanted, I thought perhaps that would make people take me a little bit more seriously if I wasn't, you know, wearing heels, if I wasn't wearing makeup, if I, you know, was, was dressed very plainly in contrast to what I would normally choose to wear. Um, and I could kick myself for that, but that, that's the reality of, of sort of what it felt like. Now I have learned to embrace all of those like, you know, multitude aspects of myself. And I would encourage other people to do as well, because for me, it's led to this ability to go do the things I'm passionate about. I was able to start a fashion line around space. I was able to start, you know, a children's book, writing, all of these things. It comes from stoking passions and not hiding different aspects of your personality. I love that. And uh, that's a great note to end on. Um, but I do want to make sure that that person gets a book recommendation. So any books that are your favorite beyond this incredible one right here? Yeah, absolutely. Current favorite right now is called Liftoff by Eric Berger. It came out yesterday, was its publication day. Oh. I had an early copy of it last year. I read it cover to cover in uh, just in one sitting. It tracks the early days of SpaceX as a company, but Eric uh, is an incredible space reporter and he really had unprecedented access from Elon Musk and the earliest engineers at SpaceX to tell the story. I mean, I remember watching all these things happen through the headlines, but now seeing the inside scoop on what was really going on inside those walls for you know one of the most consequential companies of the decade is fascinating. So Lift Off by Eric Berger. Great. And uh, Kelly, for people who don't already uh, follow you, where can they follow you to, to, to stay with you on your journey and keep up to date with your work? Yeah, everywhere. I am on every platform. <laughs> I can't even keep them straight anymore, but I am <laughs> at Kelly Girardi uh, across all, just my first name, last name, no spaces or hyphenates. 
thank you so much for being here tonight. It was really just a pleasure to read this book, but also then get to chat with you one on one. Um, the the love is coming in into the Q and A, so I know our audience out there has had a great time with you. Um, any final thoughts or remarks from you? It was an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. And you know, I, I just want to point out that. I really, one of the things I pride myself in is being accessible. I really do try to respond to every message, every direct message that I get on social media. It may take me a while, but I promise I will get there. And so I, I want people to know that I really truly am accessible and I value that direct connection. So if there's ever anything I can help answer for someone, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much. I, I hope that we can stay in touch and, and we will for the next release. Like I said, we'll do it on site here, uh, maybe in the planetarium. Uh, that'll be a fun, a fun venue. But thank you again so much. Um, for everyone out there, as I've been saying all night, you can pick up your own copy autographed by Kelly. Um, you still have time. You can pick that up uh, through our friends at Porter Square Books. That link is on your screen right now. Um, so make sure you go and pick up a copy of that. Thank you again, Kelly. Thank you to our friends at the Lowell Institute for making tonight possible. Um, and thank you to all of you for watching and spending your Wednesday night with us. We hope you will continue to do so all season long. And I want to end with a plug for our event next week on Wednesday, February, or February, March, what day is it? March 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, it's a program that we're calling the Millennials Aren't All Right, uh, Gen Y and COVID-19. We have a, a fantastic panel of millennial voices from all over the world and different industries who are gonna share their experiences over the past year and, and their thoughts for the future of that generation after COVID. Um, so details uh, of that will pop up as you exit the virtual theater tonight. Um, we hope to see you then, but until then, stay safe, stay well. Thank you again, Kelly. Have a wonderful night.